Greetings everyone, good to see you. I hope and trust that you are doing well today. Today my subject is when power becomes an obsession. When power becomes an obsession. Part 1. My passage of scripture comes from the gospel according to St. Mark chapter 10 35 to 41 mark 10 35 to 41 and the bible says and james and john the sons of zebedee come unto him saying master we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire and he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what he asked. Can he drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with and they said unto him we can and Jesus said unto them ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I shall drink of and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared and when the ten heard it they began to be much displeased with James and John bow your heads with me as we pray Heavenly Father, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Bless this message for this messed age and may it resonate with some people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When power becomes an obsession, as we get close and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, we would be remiss if we did not take an unobstructive look at where we are and where God would have us to be. For if you should look at this nation, you would find that in every walk of life, even in the church, there is some sort of power, obsession, for the sake of our sermon today, we need to define these two terms, one power and one obsession. The dictionary defines power as the ability to act or to do. And for the sake of this message, we need to take that a little further and say, power is the ability to achieve purpose. But what is an obsession? According to the Webster's Dictionary, an obsession is an abnormal preoccupation with the persistent thought or idea that has a direct influence on our conduct or our brethren. In our country, we see that power is woven into the very fabric and appears in the threads of the cloth of life down here on planet Earth. Wherever you go, you cannot escape people talking about two things, one called power and the other control. The word is, 
we need to go back and realize that these power and control issues are not something that is new but they are something that has always been around. If you look at the fashion industry, you would see that that industry has their power suits and their power bow ties and power neckties. The business industry has its power brokers and its power luncheons. In Jamaica, we have power athletes and we have power runners and we have power sprinters. In cricket we have power hitters and in football we have power scorers and we see the effect of power even in our day-to-day -day relationships. We have some leaders who have power and because of this obsession they are hungry for power they somehow start thinking like Nebuchadnezzar who believe that his kingdom should last forever there are some CEOs and some managers who believe that their times in power should not expire they also believe that they are never right the worker is always wrong and they are always right and so you see beloved friends they behave that God favors them more than anyone else and they can't make any mistakes at all but I have a word for them today beloved friends I want you to know that everybody has a time coming and some of you who don't treat people good when you are coming down the ladder of success you will see those people who you treated badly going up the ladder of success and so power makes some people think they are immune to mistakes greater than everyone else. They think they are wiser than Solomon and can spend money like Judas. And so it is down here as we wrestle back and forth dealing with issues of power and control of obsession and possession that we begin to understand Jesus' dilemma as James and John the sons of thunder came before him with this request. But we need to take a few minutes and examine just where this story unfolds. The gospel, according to Mark, is a power gospel. If you should look at the record very carefully, you would see that Mark was in a hurry to write his story. Out of all other Gospels, Mark's Gospel was written first. It is the Gospel according to John Mark by way of the testimony of Peter himself. Peter was a very interesting character. Peter was a type A personality. Peter was always going to be hot or cold. He was never wishy-washy. And so Peter relates his story of the life of Christ. John Mark, beloved friends, begins to color it and to show us, beloved friends, a life of action. You see, Mark was writing to the unsaved people, not Jews, but primarily to Gentiles. Not those who live in Palestine, but those who lived outside of Palestine. So he does not revet our, our attention by what Jesus said, but he grabs our attention by what Jesus did. He is an action man 
and God presents his word to us. We see Matthew presenting Jesus as king. Mark presents him as a man of action. Luke presents him as a medical man. And John presents him as the light of the world. The power gospel carries Jesus from the anointing to his temptation to Christ, finally meeting the demoniac, the possessed, the maimed, the lame, the halt, the withered. He is healing because Mark does not have a lot of time with what Jesus talked about. If you want to find out who a person is, you can better communicate that by what the person do as opposed to what the person say. One writer says, you speak so loudly I can't hear you. Well, in this power gospel, we see Jesus had taken time out to heal a leper, to cleanse and deliver those who were possessed by the devil. Things got so busy, beloved friends, in the life of Christ that people started lining up on the streets with the sick because Jesus did not have time enough to do the preaching and the healing. So he just passed by and people and they would grab the hold of his hem and would be healed immediately. Well, James and John do not come to the request innocently but they were eyewitness of the glory of Christ and the power of his ministry. Every now and then we find down here those persons who possess what we call presence. There is something about them when they walk into a room all eyes fixed on them. They hold our thinking and our hearing by every word that comes out of their mouth. But today, beloved friends, if we must have the right understanding of what power is, we must first understand that we cannot even understand power until we have a purpose. You see, power without a purpose is just a recipe for disaster. If you do not know what your purpose is, then your power will be used in a corrupt form. Where there is power, there has to be a purpose and a reason for that power existing in the first place. I don't know about you, but when you understand who you are and when you understand whose you are, you will not worry about what people say you are. Because in the midnight hour of your own experience, you know that you have been called. You have been quickened by the Spirit of Christ. And if people love you, that's all right. If they hate you, that's all right. If they say amen, that's all right. If they go to sleep on you, that's all right. Because you see the same God that called you and woke you up this morning and start you on your way will still have an anointing on your life whether they change or not. And so, beloved friends, if you can't do nothing but criticize, and try to put down individuals. I want you to know today, may the Lord watch between me and you while we are absent one from another. The word is, when you understand your purpose, you can get some things done. When you understand not only whose you are, but why you are. Because down here, the person who understands power to do something will always have a job. But the person who understands why it is done will always be their boss. And so you need to know how and why, for in this life, power cannot separate, cannot be separated 
from a purpose. We see that David was a frail shepherd boy, but there was this giant who was talking some bad things about God, and David got tired of hearing that. And the Bible says he was not called to fight Goliath. But watch this. He said, is there a cause in Israel? And so he understood that there is a purpose for each and every one of us to stand up for the things of God. And because he stood up, Goliath was slain. You see, we need to know today if we understand our own purpose. The giants in our lives will die. The giant of skepticism, the giant of racism, the giant of cynicism, the giant of criticism, the giant of nepotism, they will all vanish away if we understand our purpose. And so we cannot afford to abort the process because if we abort the process, we might just abort our purpose. The story is told of a theologian. And in the meantime, where there is power, there is a purpose and there has to be obedience. So the story is told of a theologian professor who continued to ask his students every year, the new class coming in, why did the ark float? And like some of us, we would say, well, it was built to float and boats float and it was on water and so it floated. You would have received the same grade which they receive, which was an F. They fail. The reason, according to the professor, the art floated is because those who were engaged in the building thereof were obedient to God. That is the reason the ark floated. And so where there is no obedience, there can be no blessing because God is not in the habit of blessing the disobedience. Somebody say amen. If you want to be blessed by God, you need to put disobedience away and let God come in and bless you because he will not bless you in your waywardness to the degree that you want to be blessed. We have to have a purpose in life and it is God's desire that we lock into who he is and what he requires of us. The Bible reminds us in Philippians chapter 2 that we need an example of what obedience was. It was all about a cause. You would know who we are and how we uh, like to talk, talk different kind of theological implications so we can rationalize our premise. But you know how we and what we are like. We use a lot of excuses saying, well, Lord, nobody lived a righteous life. And that's why I am acting up and cutting up and living down low and not living the life that you call me to live. And God will say this in heaven. Look at the picture. God the Father, beloved friends, humans are no complaining. So he says to Jesus, Jesus, I want you to go down to earth. Go down there and show them what it is like to live a life that is totally obedient to me. Because Jesus, if you live a life that is totally obedient to me, then what will happen? We will take away all of their excuses. So at the cross, where we first saw the light, the burdens of our hearts were rolled away. 
It was there by faith we receive our sight and know we are happy all the way and without excuses. Talking about power today, I want you to know there can be no power without a purpose. So here it is now. God sent Jesus to planet Earth to show us that there is wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. But before we understand power, we have to go through a process and learn obedience. And when we are in the process, we learn how to be free from the burden of sin. You recognize that there is wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. And so, beloved friends, next week, join us again at the Bridgeview Seventh-day Adventist Church for the conclusion of When Power Becomes an Obsession, Part 2. God bless you.